Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Karel Ulner. Karel is a music producer and the founder of Polar Bowl Productions. Karel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Spencer. It's a pleasure to always be back with you. Yeah, good to have you back. I, I, you just kind of went full bore on the company, so it'll be interesting to hear how that's been and get into kind of some of the changes and where your where your head's at with it all and, and what that's been like. So I'm kind of excited to jump right in and, and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So last time we were speaking about half a year ago, um, I was talking about the basic idea of building like a creative community where basically uh, multimedia creators are able to come together and make a bigger impact through collaboration, whether that means that uh, we're able to uh, kind of uh, pull together teams to work as part of a larger project or starting something totally from scratch um, to build it up to that level. Um, I built uh, campaigns for myself and for others that have reached the dance charts in various countries. Cool. Um, one of the more notable ones being, uh, you know, the Billboard dance charts even. Um, and uh, my goal is to try to insert whatever help I can um, into uh, people's projects to help them get to that quality and uh, the cons also the consistency to kind of get someone's career up to that level. And I want to so, say um, again, thanks for getting me back into EDM by sending me some of your stuff like that. That was good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Of course. There's a lot more EDM coming, uh, coming your way. And I have a bunch of things I could really say about that in itself. But it's uh, um, like EDM has been one of the many genres I've worked on. I'm currently working on everything from like various dance music subgenres to recording singer songwriters. Cool. I have a project <laughs> where it's like I'm literally going to this guy's apartment and it's my challenge for myself to be able to record his entire like record on a handheld um, Zoom recorder. Badass. And uh, <laughs> and it's and find and basically throw that into the computer and uh, you know just arrange around it and turn it into a, a hit as if it was recorded in any other major studio. So like to prove really that you could do it from anywhere and it's a uh, What kind of recording the, equipment are you using all, just to nerd out for a sec? Yeah, so attached to that, um, I could technically put in like it's a, it's the what's the Zoom H6, so I'm able to throw in um, on top of the the stereo. I believe it's a Rode Rode stereo mic that's attached to the actual thing. It, I can throw in six other microphones that to is. really just capture the entire room. <laughs> that's so <laughs> and, cool. Um, yeah, and and you, you can capture the, a full band that way if you want to. But my approach has been capturing various aspects of an acoustic guitar in a room or um and i don't by the way i don't even use that many mics i, I use the i'm able to get a really great sound just by using one stereo pair of mics and if i want to i'll add like one or two extra you, mics to kind of blend extra character are you using the road pair that's on the device or are you using external mics typically or, or some combination of both for this one actually just a road pair that came on uh, as an attachment nice it's uh no, nothing nothing crazy it comes right with the uh, with the zoom h6 and uh um i do have some other like secret weapon mics that i do use for character just some like a uh, couple uh like neumann pencil mics that you could you use that for anything from uh, capturing the overheads of a drum set to um you know capturing an orchestra to uh whatever but it captures it, that in such like a uh, kind of a warm and fluffier way than you, what you would consider a, a little colder, rougher a pr a recording that you would say you'd get from your laptop or something like that. So that's awesome. That's uh, but you don't need much to make great records, and that's what I'm aiming to prove with this project. Nice. That's really badass. And like, I'm such a nerd for like audio equipment. I mean, I not as much as you. It sounds like, but I, I just enjoy. Um, I don't know. I've got like a Sherwood S5002 tube amp at home and I've got a um, Pioneer, I think it's an SA65 too, uh, that I, I, I like to pump sound through and, and listen to just in my living room. And I don't know. I mean, the, there's just four like Marantz MPM 1000s here. So like pretty entry level stuff, like nothing, nothing fancy. But um, I don't know. I mean, I was, you know, I, I was the audio engineer today working on this. So I feel like 
it's kind of fun to to nerd out about this stuff and to hear you know what you're doing because you've obviously got more domain experience than me and so i'm kind of listening intently being like maybe i'll learn something here and know what to do but it sounds like the point isn't even that like it's not having tons of bespoke equipment or you know being totally in the weeds the point is that you can do a lot with a little and and that's really cool oh yeah and uh i think last time we talked a lot about even um all the information you can find on youtube just like to be able to use basic basic tools i mean um obviously when you're doing something for the first time it's not obvious how all this stuff works but like um i guess what i want to get out there is that you could um like once you know what you're trying to achieve there are all kinds of tools at your disposal um you don't have to invest a whole ton of money to be able to make something great you could easily accomplish your goals with like homemade tools basically that's awesome and i mean what i really like is i mean I don't know. People that listen to the podcast will notice we had a gap because we have all this custom equipment and some of it's got legacy drivers because we're running all this weird stuff. And I, I feel like the more you get away from that and the more you get to the, you know, like a tool you can wrap, like if I could just order, you know, like that Zoom recorder and, and have it, you know, and not have to configure all this custom stuff, you know, that becomes a much more replicable setup. And it's, you know, you can you can run that, you know, all over the world over and over again and train people up a lot faster because you can have the same setup as them. And then if it breaks, you just get another one. You don't have to rebuild your entire rig. Like, it just seems like a great way to do things, you know, if you can make it work, which it sounds like you are. So that's that's super cool. Props. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. And uh, I recommend, uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk about, like, like plugins and in, in the computer and all that, whatever helps. uh um kind of on that end too because i definitely like one of the keys to modern production again is what you can do in the box just like you you probably know from video editing or anything uh, um anything related to that you can just do you can do so much just on your smartphone but just imagine what you can do with the digital tools that we have now you can practically replicate um like once, once a sample has been recorded properly and you can import it into pro tools or whatever you use um, you know, you don't, um, you don't have to do much anymore outside the box. You can just totally, uh, manipulate, um, sounds to basically program an entire rock band. You can program an entire orchestra. Um, we're sort of getting to that point where you could really program an orchestra for a film trailer or whatever, and people can't tell the difference. That's awesome. Um, it's pretty incredible. Is that using recordings of like actual orchestras to make the sound like they used to do, or is there like a new tech that's come in since then? Because I think that was like a thing for a bit, like when I last checked in maybe ten years ago. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Originally, um, all these are all these sounds are based on um, well-recorded samples, and um, the quality keeps getting better and better because nice. we have much more expansive libraries of uh, different players, different. Uh, different feels, different uh, rooms, and all that. You're able to have all these different options to really make it realistic. Um, but um, I think because uh, we also live in a world where we're used to hearing electronics as well, um, it is becoming easier to even... Uh, uh, we have better and better software synths as well that are able to replicate these kinds of sounds. It's oh. not always based on... Not always based on the uh, um, uh, the the original sample, even though it might replicate the qualities of it. That's fucking cool. <laughs> I mean, like, that's super interesting. So, when would you choose to use a synth versus a recording? I mean, like, what what makes that determination in your mind as an artist? Or I guess as a producer, um, more even than as an artist, like as a craftsman, you know. Absolutely, I think that when you're trying. We, we are getting very close to where you can't tell the difference anymore between the software synth sound uh, that's been, you know, of course, crafted to be as close to the real thing as possible and the and the real thing. Um, the, the main reason would be feel. If you're trying to look for um, an authentic, um, as authentic as possible of a, of a feel of a, of a, of a violin or um, 
some sort of string instrument that really requires that kind of little nuance of having that person, you know, get, getting that, you know, the final little things that make it obvious that this is like a real person playing a violin or getting the the real, um, how do I say it, the, the air that goes into the flute when you're, you know, playing the flute, you're not, um, how, how do I maybe reframe this? Um, you can make anything sound similar from a distance. But if you're trying to, if once you're grading into the final nuances of making it, uh, making a very detailed, uh, detailed sound, um, the software synths are a little bit clunkier than actually having a, either a real sample or a real player, because um, you will never quite get the perfect uh, uh, nuance of the picking of the string or the picking of the of the blowing of the flute or anything like that um, from the software synth. It'll always sound a little bit more. Contrived. Yeah. Yes. And but, if you, but definitely what the software synth can do that you can't uh, then get from the real instrument. I mean, unless you you can always bend around the samples if you want, but um, you can have string sections that hold a note forever. You can have um, much more power behind um, certain sounds that are made in a software um, since just because of the um you could add these unnatural um you know bass tones to it that necessarily wouldn't exist in the um in the real instrument let's say that's cool um so you so a lot of edm these days is like in that context at least you know you um it, it's it's easy I, I would definitely uh always have a blend of the two um to get one for the real for the feel and the software for the power. Like, oh, if I okay. Had to compare the two. So, like, if I'm following, like, you might have a transition point where you go from natural to unnatural, and you'd start out with the recorded, and then you would, at some point, replace that with the synth, and then you would start to modulate the effects to accentuate, like the stuff you just can't do with the recording, um, and that would be like something you might do when you're making a track. If I'm understanding. Yes, that, okay, that, cool. that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. No, no, no. Exactly. Thank you for explaining. I'm this is I'm learning this for the first time, so I'm just I'm processing. Right, this is how I figure out if I'm getting it correctly. Is I repeat, and you're like, "You're wrong, asshole." You know, we're like, "Oh yeah." That you makes know, I'm, sense. Try, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in layman's terms and try to help visualize that. So it's not. Too I feel like you dumbed it no. down successfully. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like, "Oh, that's awesome." <laughs> And, and I can think of examples in like EDM I like of, of where they do stuff like that. And I've never, it's never occurred to me how the sausage is made as it were. And so it's kind of neat to, to be able to understand it from your perspective, or at least at a high level. I mean, I obviously haven't done it yet at a low level, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> it's, uh, um, and uh, again, uh, even going back to this project with the singer songwriter where all his parts will be recorded in in the apartment, just using the simple tools. Um, anything I add on top of that, I mean, I can. Um, all the drums are going to be recorded based off of electronic samples. Cool. All the, the the bass and the bass and the piano will all be programmed. But I can guarantee you that if you didn't know that, you would probably not you would not know because you're able to create such a great blend of having the real feel of an acoustic guitar, the real vocals on top, the real, all the, the, the harmonies on top will, um, uh, create that nuance that you're looking for from that artist. But you just add these other elements for the, just to fill in the space and you don't care as much about the nuance of those. So it's okay for it to be electronic. Yeah. You know, it makes a lot of sense. um, it's, uh, it'll all come together in that nice way. And, more and more people are again producing in this way it's made it possible to make hit records because people um and they seem to enjoy that they seem to be okay with that yeah um well i would imagine also just the budget to hire a band to play and to set up you know do the audio engineering for it like it's probably prohibitive for a lot of artists and i would just assume it's quite expensive i mean you barely see big bands anymore like I remember seeing the Mingus big band at the Blue Note in, uh, you know, I think it's in the Village, and I, um, it's it's kind of a treat because there's not very many big bands because no one can afford to pay a big band because you got to pay everyone's salary across, you know, like six to twenty pieces, and 
that gets expensive, which is prohibitive, and that means a lot of times you just don't have it anymore. So it's neat to know that there's another path to achieving a similar sound. Right, and obviously that's it's awful in its own way that it's become so difficult um, to have these huge collectives in that way. Um, I don't. It's not that it doesn't happen anymore, but it, it, it's actually more likely that you'll have someone record their part remotely and they'll send it to you and you get the piece together again in Pro Tools, you know? It's just, uh, it'll be faster. You don't have to get everyone together and pay, pay for the time for everyone to be there. Um, and if you screw up one and, take, uh, now you have to pay everyone again to re-record even if yeah. it was just one hungover person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's also the, that's the, you know, the beauty of, I guess, the, the modern way. I mean, I guess it's not as great for the music studios that... Um, uh, obviously invested millions into the gear that they have and it's obviously the classic gear that all our software is based on and you know you would love to uh, you need to have a way for that to still exist uh, but maybe the the form that it's going to be in 10 years from now is going to um, who knows maybe it's a software company that ends up owning this technology they end up uh, I don't know, the, the studios end up creating more samples and they do record real artists. It's just uh, becomes harder and harder to maintain all that. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, I mean, it sounds like you still are recording real artists, but you're just doing it in a way that's modular because you can record one artist here, one artist there, one artist here, and synchronize it now, like, you know, with people in different parts of the world. Um, and so that's pretty cool. So, okay, so we started to talk before we recorded about local versus global. I feel like this is a good transition point as to what the current work looks like in that regard. Um, do you, do you want to talk to that at all about like kind of where you find the balance there? Sure, absolutely. So the goal, obviously, with the uh, amount of, so maybe a little bit of backtracking is, uh, I guess, maybe this will also tie into the whole copyright thing, but um in today's world, to be able to show that you have a, a, a decent audience and that uh, you have the quantity to make money off of, a, whether it's advertising or royalties or whatever, you really, it is much easier <laughs> yeah, to think <laughs> that you need a global audience. And you that is obviously the goal. You obviously want to get there because then, you know, in today's world, uh, you know, uh, a billion streams is more like a, a diamond record than... Uh, than what it what used to be like a million or 10 million uh album albums purchased like that's that's really what everyone's striving for how do we get to like a billion streams of anything and doing that as frequently as possible like that's that's really the only way that we're able to like properly um make money off of like let's say one piece of work um that's but... interesting who's achieved that like a billion streams i mean i, I was listening to the Wu-Tang Clan yesterday and on their most popular song, which was Cream, it was still only 300 million. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious. And that's like, not bad at all. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. I mean, I, I think in today's global metrics, like the goal is obviously a billion plays. And if you can go beyond that, then great. But like um, it's the it becomes a more of a global hit once you're like reaching 100 million plays and you know, legacy artists obviously have that. And like, if you're a new artist, hitting that is, you know, a milestone to prove that you, um, that you should really, you could go tour a headlining tour and like, you'll be able to bring a, obviously anywhere you know, in sales world. in various areas. Yeah. yeah. Anywhere in the world. That makes a lot um, of sense. Except maybe North Korea, because you know, they don't have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and like, and the million the million plays today is the uh, uh, people have talked about this forever uh, at least the last 10 years a million plays has is still the benchmark to kind of know that if you have an idea that approaches 10, 10 million views in anything that's probably something that has legs people will continue to share that and it's uh you know you have um y you have uh, an actual fan base that you can use um to kind of gather gather data, figure out what it is that like people want to hear more of. Um, not to at all put down like the artists that are not at that level yet. That's obviously what I'll be getting to, trying to get to that million plays. But the um, see, this is the difference between still being. It's still important to have a local focus because you'll never get to understanding 
any group of people if you can't focus in on one. Yeah. Like exactly. if you can't truly understand, like just like with the, um, and, and we really like I I'm not sure how someone who was ten years, or twenty years younger than me views this, but back when I was in high school, like the goal was to just get your group of, um, I don't know, let's say, I mean. I'm pushing it by saying 20 people but if you have like 20 friends who used to came through your through your you know jam band you know garage or basement or whatever <laughs> if they liked what you're making you know they'll come to your show and that was good enough to like put on a local show nice. and then people heard about you and they might buy like a t-shirt or something and that's like that was uh i mean that still is a way for people to to make money but it's not nearly focused on enough because everyone's always focused on the big global numbers um if you're able to it just it doesn't matter what industry and you're in if you're a personal trainer or a musician or really anything if you're able to get like a core group of people to really like you and you can like make a couple bucks so you can do it again that really should be the goal because <laughs> then you can ex then you can extrapolate that out to like um you know then we can then we can talk about the quantity how we can like get more quantity of content out there to get um get more data you know figure out like what people like maybe do more of this and than that and keep going down that path but like the local still matters because you have to find that core people if, That's if interesting. it's 20 people i feel like that applies to to contract engineering as well as i as i perform it because you know ska has a bunch of core clients mostly in pittsburgh some in boston some in the bay area but i mean it's kind of what you said like we mostly focus on the pittsburgh market because I would say it's easier, but it's it's easier. It's cheaper. Like to, to sell locally and to get people like you where you're at, then you can make a little bit of money and get to do it again. You know, and if you really love what you're doing, that's you're just excited to get to do it again. And I I mean it's it's weird to compare contract engineering to music production or being in a band, but I don't think it's all that different. And so like I don't know. I mean, I think it's a similar model, and it's interesting to hear you talk about it because I feel like it's related. And, and it applies right. to, to both worlds. Exactly. And it's, um, and again, the tool that we tools that we have to have that global reach, hope you would obviously hope that you get those, not just one pocket of 20 people, but if you can get that in various parts of the country, maybe that allows you to go visit them. Um, that's you know, hopefully maybe not 20 people is not enough to have grounds for a tour, but like, you know, at least you, tr you, you can, um, then try to figure out like what's going on there what's what are the reasons why people are are listening or tuning in for whatever reason and like try to uh how do we do more of that how do we do more of that and i think this is uh not this is only this is half the battle obviously the other half of the battle should be that you should enjoy what you're doing regardless i mean especially in and something I... like music or the arts like to get um kind of going to the the quantity piece of things is that in in today's world the one thing that's really inescapable is that we're not living in a world where um you put out one album or a couple singles leading up to an album and then that's how you know it's it's an event um it, it's uh, like uh, like it might have been yeah like 10 or 20 years <laughs> ago and it's it's just uh we're, we're living in a world where to get the amount of but we just have we have so much competition in terms of quantity of content in all areas that like you have to simply um, find a way to like stay engaged. Yeah. If you stay, if you lose contact with somebody, let's say you don't talk to your friend for a week, they're probably going to wonder where you went, and like, you know, what's the I, I don't know. They might not care about what you're doing anymore. I mean, uh, hopefully a good friend does. But you know, in terms of fans, they don't. They'll move on to the next thing if you're not staying engaged. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we missed like a month of podcasts, right? And I was like, oh my god, we gotta get back online. Fuck, you know. Like first it was people just kept canceling, and then it was just like the equipment broke. <laughs> it's like god damn it, you know, we gotta get right. back in there because we're gonna lose our foothold. Exactly. It's it's not always that way, but like the uh, you know, if you view today's um, content, I, I say content because music has sort of because of the sheer quantity has become just a content creation game. Just like creating YouTube videos, um, you're probably 
probably doing both realistically if you're a musician you're creating some sort of social media visual content that goes along with uh with your with their music so you're you just have to view what you do as um it's a constant dialogue and and it's easier to uh release something new when you have a dialogue going rather than trying to restart it every time you're doing something new um just because you know, it's not necessarily even the trends change. It's just there's always something going on to steal your fans' attention away. Yeah. Um, so momentum is key, and and consistency is, is key. key. That's interesting. I mean, I've heard that a lot with podcasting, and I've not really tried my hand at making music lately, and I shouldn't be because I suck at it. <laughs> but it's interesting to know that there's some universal lessons across a lot of different fields. And I, I think you've accrued some serious wisdom here. I mean, just from what you're talking about, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm kind of rambling here, but yeah, I mean, this is, it's, this a, is it's okay. And uh, it's really, uh, it's really made me think, especially recently that um, the, the way that um, uh, the way that uh, the engagement piece has become a much easier way to build a fan base than focusing on too hard on any one piece of content, it's really made me think that um, we might be in a, um, how, how would I say, it? a sort of a crossroads where artists need to, it, it's, it's significantly changing the way that uh, artists focus on the quality of their their content, unfortunately. I think the, the the approach of being able to write a song and focus really on that really great song, uh, making that the best version it could possibly be, is, is just gone. I think we're living in a world where you can if you can come up with as many permutations of, as possible of that one idea and like find a way to post that once a day for a whole month, people are more likely to actually... That's act, interesting. Like, is like, it the same people that like are engaging? Or are you trying to capture a wider audience by hitting all the permutations? Because I've noticed that with your your songs is that there's a whole bunch of different edits or releases or permutations. And I'm like, I'm just thinking to myself, like, I like all of these in different ways, but also like, are these capturing different folks from the context of this conversation? So what is it from your perspective? Like why milk a single piece of art that way by tweaking it and putting it out this way and that way and that other way what's what's the logic behind it absolutely so this i, I started focusing on that really back in uh in uh really around 2014 2015 i started realizing that uh this was maybe to give some context like not everyone was putting out remixes of their songs back then like people it was more of a niche thing where it was kind of like oh like it's cool that skrillex did a remix of uh this artist or that artist and like you know it, it was just kind of a extra expression of an idea rather than it being like an industry tool to like you know get everyone to listen to that one song but it's um i realized that that was happening and the you know what i what i realized is that even like i have favorites too favorite versions depending on the scenario some are more chill like they suit my mood in, a, in one er one area and then another might suit um my mood in some other situation and it's just uh um if you're able to hit all those marks um you know people might not even like your voice or the song like particularly but like they <laughs> they they like you know they like that one version and it suited their mood at that time, and like that's the reason why they listen to it. And it's like um, I, I kind of just like embraced that and realized that it's just not not worth like agonizing over that one thing when you could you'll have you'll make another version another day, and that'll hit a whole other audience. And I mean, yeah, then, then that kind of begs the question: that do you want to fo focus in on? Um, one of those sub audiences more than the other, which is like what we kind of ended up doing with with my own artist brand with my sister. Um, like just just a quick uh, recap that like I used to make music from metal music to um, like EDM and we ended up focusing in the end more so on like vocal trance, like progressive house type of music yeah. because 
through making all these versions, we realize that this audience is actually more receptive to us than the other ones. Um, they That's like hearing, cool. they like hearing our voice in this context. So let's just lean into that more. Um, but we wouldn't have known unless we had gone through that journey. Yeah, it makes sense. So, um, so I so I guess to sort of summarize, you have you're able to hit so many different uh, groups that you otherwise would have never hit. But then you can also use that as a learning lesson to be like, okay, we're gonna we can go down this path um, and create an even tighter bond with this group if we choose to. Um, and I love to view like the work that we do as creating like a we're creating a contribution to like a canon of music that already exists. Yeah. Um, the better we can do that or make some sort of like, even better if we're able to make like a some sort of change in the revolutionary change like Skrillex did for you know dubstep at the time that he came out that's even more exciting but you just don't get there until you've gone through that journey you know yeah it almost sounds like you're collecting data and you're trying different things out to see what lands and what doesn't and if the goal is number of listens then that's an easy metric to align to and just be like okay and and it's not totally like if you just say number of listens it almost sounds like you're selling out but it's not face you you want to it takes effort <laughs> to go and make a thing like a work product a piece of art and you want your thing to have maximum impact and live in the world in a way that impacts as many people in a positive way as possible i, I know i do and so if you're going to put in all that work and you're going to put your heart and your soul and age and spend x number of years of your life you want to make sure you're maximizing your impact and so if you've got data to ensure that outcome, which is, you know, when we do this kind of music, people seem to be receptive and enjoy it more than when we do that kind of music. Maybe we'll do this kind of music. And I enjoy making both these kinds of music, but society seems to really enjoy vocal trance. So let's make more vocal trance. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's, right. That's really and cool. then, But then on the contrary, it's not always... Um... You don't have to take that approach where you, um, you you could do something totally experimental as well. And I'm absolutely for that, too. Um, I, I think, though, that um, what I find with just artist types in general is that why I keep emphasizing the quantity and the consistency to create momentum is that you could have the craziest new idea, but if you just do it once and you just leave it there, like nobody will ever know. Like nobody, like all these people who could have learned about what you're doing with that sound, like they'll never know unless you created, a, unless you accept kind of these, these facts about being able to engage with people in today's like landscape. Unfortunately, it's like um, artists love to really hone in on this one perfect creation, and that is guilty. You know, yeah, it's 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 heartbreaking when you uh, like when you have to pull yourself away from that. But that, it's uh, if it gets in the way of you being able to create more of that stuff that people might potentially love, it's going to be hard. Yeah, well, hard that's I think that's pretty universal. I mean, I've definitely spent a lot of time polishing something where I should have just moved on to the next project, but I didn't do it because I was in love with the idea of creating the perfect permutation of this thing in particular. And so, I don't know, it's interesting to know that that's a universal experience for a creative or an artist, as you put it. And it's not just limited to me and my dumb ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's, it's like, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm guilty of it too. And like, I, I do think that the, the time, and if you do choose to try to come up with something totally new and making sure that it works, like um, just make sure you don't spend your time making a, a song one song for one for a whole year like you know people it's much more likely it's just simply the data shows unfortunately that the more exposure people have to a certain idea i mean whether it is that you spend a million dollars to try to promote that one song so everyone hears it or or this you know more realistically coming up with more similar songs that you can release on a monthly or you know ideally a weekly basis like you would be able to uh it would be much more effectively cultivating an audience that way so those remixes yeah. are just leveraging a similar concept or both remixes could they could leverage a similar concept um it, 
although there's more to that as well. I could talk about the more kind of Machiavellian way of going about that too, which is I'm like... Interested. I've read the 48 Laws of Power and the Prince. Let's talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like the, the, the more Machiavellian view of it is that you could, you know, which is what the industry does regularly, is that you're... Um, if uh, it's the easiest way to reach a, an audience that if you know that something works as an audience, like get a remix done by someone who already has an audience. And like that is also a, that's just the easiest way to break something through. That's like an automatic win. Yeah, and it's um, that obviously takes investment. That's a different type of way of working. But like uh, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that until you already have a core fan base and you kind of know what you're going for. Yeah, well, it almost but sounds like, like that's more of a marketing approach where you're just you know, this is our goal. How do we achieve that? You know? Right. And, but that's what that happens all the time in the industry. And this is, I, I want to say that because I want that. I want people to understand that that's a little bit separate than what they should be focusing on when they're first starting. Like if you're creating, let's say remixes in the similar domain, like, um, I would say that, I like to I like to approach things as broadly as possible and just really just you're re you're removing uh, the options as you go along. You just kind of see that over time that certain things don't work. You move on a little bit from that, hone in a little bit more on uh, ideas that do work. Then you can, as you said, like really hone in on a certain domain, make remixes in that one world. Um, uh, that's the way I would kind of just broadly speaking would go about doing things. Like you. Like I would have never, like if I had honed in into uh, purely making metal music when I was like 16, I and never explored EDM music as an option. Like I would have probably not been able to. Uh, um, I don't know. Maybe I would have come up with something really interesting in the metal music world. I don't know. But like I wouldn't have gone down the path that I have and been able to make all the connections that I had that were actually happening in the. I don't know the explosion of creativity that was happening in the EDM world at the time. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so, um, that that was, I mean, again, that was an interesting story in itself. Like, I wouldn't have necessarily gone into EDM music had it not been so hard to keep a band together. Like that. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? It's it, but like I, you know. <laughs> It's, it's funny to think about how things like turn out, but that's. Like... I, I just love the verbiage of "had it not been so hard to keep a band together" like that. <laughs> yeah, it cracks me up because like I, I don't know what it's like, but it definitely is a little bit of a cliche, and I believe you. <laughs> so... Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's easier to go full force and like be the one man band and find a ways to perform that way than it was to, um, you know, I don't know, just like going back to everything that we talked about before. Imagine how hard it would be to hold you know a band together Pretty getting fast. all these things done that need to be done versus just being able to kind of focus on your own and like yeah it's at a least different, get the basics done really well it's a different you know. set of skills to be able to manage creatives than it is to create it's a totally different set of skills i mean and i'm talking from the perspective of engineering right now because that's what i know but it's to get engineers and designers to work toward a common goal is it's my bread and butter, but it's also, it's, it's not easy. It, it takes, you have to be a psychologist. You have to be an engineer. You have to understand design to some extent. You have to be a strategist. You have to, you know, perceive like the most minute aspects of human expression and then hyper-focus in on it. And sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you come off like Joseph Stalin because you're looking into things that don't even exist. But other times, you know, it's just like, oh, I caught that way before it became an issue. Ah, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. You know, and so I feel like it's similar. Like, I, and I, I hate, I'm sorry to keep drawing parallels between my business and your your business, but it's a conversation. So <laughs> that, that's, no, that's fantastic. I, I love that there's all these parallels because I, I do believe it at the end of the day that if, um, I don't believe that the music industry is that different than other industries, and I think it's uh, kind of doing people, it does people a disservice to make them think that this is something um, that defies like the laws of 
reality. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> there's just certain rules psychology that don't or, work or, in business. Yeah, the laws of people. Like, I mean, people are people are people. You know, they're going to be people. <laughs> you can, right. I think when you understand that, like, I mean, you've got a tremendous advantage. But, I mean, you still need to be, you know, a, a viable creator of work product. Uh, on one project we got into recently, excuse me, I, I've really been enjoying jumping into the engineer's role and not just being this manager that doesn't do anything. I, I've kind of, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't wanting to do this when we started. I, I'm like, you know, I need to focus on sales and business development and all this stuff. And so I, I only have so much bandwidth to devote to being an engineer and I will hire more engineers, but then our, our client imposed a cap where we could only hire X number of engineers. And so, you know, I'm just like, well, shit, we still need to accomplish our objectives. And the only way we're going to meet our timeline with the amount of manpower we have is if I become an engineer and also do that kind of work. And what a blessing that's been, because I feel like, you know, it's easy to sit on, well, not easy. It's very difficult to manage a team like that, but it's a different set of skills to, to jump in and be an individual contributor. And I, I think a very useful one. And so I, I'm kind of proud of staying in the trenches and remaining an engineer in spite of growing this business and also being a manager. I mean, we're not that big, but you know, still, I think it's important to do everything and maybe not everything, but you know what I mean? Like to, to be the creative, but also the, the manager and, and the, the strategic person. Oh yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Like I, I love being as much as I can involved in the creation of things. I feel like that's like who I am still at heart. Um, even though, um, I guess what I'm trying to do is help organize people on a bit higher level as well to create that, um, that greater collective success, I suppose. But it's, um, yeah, I think if you're not in touch, especially in the music world, I mean, if you're not in touch with what's going on, like um, on those minute levels, it's very easy to fall behind and like not like understand a new scene that's building up or, you know, you can't really generalize things in that. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, there's the, all these certain principles I'm talking about. You can generalize you on that rusty. level, but you can yeah, you get rusty ultimately if you don't. If you just coast, the creativity if, as well. if you rest on your, your laurels, as it were, and you coast on what you did as a creative in the past, and you're just like, well, I've done there, I've been there, I've done everything. You're like, no, you haven't, you idiot. <laughs> you could spend five more careers and not have done everything. You could spend 10 more careers and not have done everything. You know, it's, nobody is ever going to be the world expert in everything. And, and that's just how it is. And there is an infinite amount of knowledge to accrue and an infinite amount of things to accomplish. And so I think that humility is really important, and I'm I'm grateful to be talking to another person who possesses it. Yeah, I, I, well, I was actually. Um, have you watched that uh, Netflix show, uh, The Playlist? That was based no, on Spotify. What's, what's that about? Uh, it's basically about the 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 growth of Spotify and like how they, how they started, and it's just not not spoiling anything. But each episode is like telling the story from another key member's point of view, and uh, <laughs> they're always kind of like. But that's not how it actually happened. <laughs> like everyone has, everyone has their own version. But wait, yeah, there's more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's it's very fascinating. I think it's like also uh, it's it's great for like anyone in the music industry to um, to kind of listen to because it really shows like how I mean all these things that we consider true now. These people were envisioning that like like practically twenty years ago now, and it's like. I, I, it's it's incredible that uh, they um, they were able to make it happen. There were many points where it could have failed, and they kind of picked themselves up by the by the bootstraps, and also like probably had some like blind, uh, maybe arrogance faith in what they were doing as well, and pushed it forward. But yeah. it's like they, <laughs> you know, it was it was just very like a. I mean, I mean, it's a combination all, of skill like, and luck. Skill. skill and luck. I mean, obviously, they they had good funding from they they, they had a uh, people who believed in them um, to help them fool around and figure something out. They also had 
very talented people working on it, obviously. But it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's, uh, it shows that it can fall apart even for them. You know, there's many points where it could have fallen apart. Yeah. Um, the playlist. So. I got to check that out. Yeah. It, it's, it's a good one. It's, uh, I, I love I, the dramatization. I also love the idea of like, you know, just rebooting to another person's view on the same event. Like that just seems like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> And, and it, it's like, uh, was it six episodes, but each from totally, totally different view, but it all comes together in like a full kind of, yeah, full understanding of kind of what happened. Yeah, that sounds like a blast. I'm going to have to watch that. That's another one. <laughs> yeah. you, you're sapping all my time, Corel. <laughs> keep, yeah, keep telling me about these awesome shows I got to check out and I'm going to check them out. <laughs> As a result, I'll have no time left for sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, I love binging Netflix. It's whenever I'm like rendering files or something, I'll pull up Netflix and like <laughs> and watch a show or something. The, the logo on the wall behind me took 14 hours to paint correctly on the wall. And while I was painting that logo on the wall, um, I listened to podcasts constantly. And it's, you know, it's fun. And so, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think when you've got that, gr when you've got to sweep the floor, when you've got to render a file, when you've got a, you know, you can't do it with systems engineering as much, unfortunately. But when you're doing shop work, I guess is how I refer to it typically in, in my line of work, is just the kind of work where you're you're more muscle than brain and you have to do a thing and it needs to get done and it's not going to get done without you. Like that's where it's helpful to have stand-up comedy or a podcast or a show and even when sometimes when I'm writing a document, like it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with like putting on, you know, like it's always sunny in Philadelphia in the background and just being like, I'm going to watch, you know, how Mac yeah. got fat while I get this done. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Oh, man, that's like, <laughs> like always sunny. It's been a while since I've seen that one. I'm looking, I'm still looking forward to a. Uh... I mean, it was a while ago the analysis, but I, I'm looking forward to any new South Park stuff. I know. Oh, dude, like, I fucking uh, love South Park. Of money. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was from Paramount, right? Or am I thinking of something different? I think it was from Paramount. Yeah. yeah. They got like hundreds of millions of dollars to make new stuff. I heard they bought Casa Bonita, like after they got that money. Like they actually bought the real life Casa Bonita as a joke. So, oh man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? <laughs> Trey Parker and Matt Stone own Casa Bonita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that, man, that, yeah. That's amazing. That's uh, <laughs> artistry right there. Yeah, for sure. No, it's taken the piss to the highest level. I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's incredible. Did you see that show they did at Red Rocks Amphitheater with? Uh, I think they had Primus and. Um, okay, so it's Primus. They had Rush, and then they had one other band that I'm trying to remember participating. And they did this like three-way concert, also with voice actors from South Park singing songs like "Uncle Fucker," and um, <laughs> it was amazing. Like uh, it was Primus, Ween, and Rush; those were the bands they had. And so, like, just to get all those guys to to be on stage at the same time. I mean, I can't remember which one, but one of them had to get back together from having broken up, and so they talked them into doing that. And then they're just like, "Shut your fucking face, Uncle Fucker," you know, <laughs> like to, <laughs> to convince you know, like. It was like four women singing that song and like belting it out, you know, and I mean, it was it was hilarious, but it was also like, you know, quite quite the endeavor. And, and so pretty cool to see that came on my YouTube feed at one point. I was like, ah, oh, this is awesome. I, I think I got like halfway through it before I had to do something. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> no, that, that sounds fantastic. I'm going to pull that up right after we're done. Yeah, dude, really definitely. Good. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that stuff. I mean, did you watch the Paramount like post COVID and uh, yeah, Streaming Wars? I watched all those ones. Yeah, I thought yeah. those were those were good. Like, I I feel like they're back to their roots, where you know they're, I mean they're back. You know, it's not like just, you know, whatever's topical. It, it's kind of I think that'll stand the test of time and, and still be good in in forty years or twenty years or whatever. Like people will watch that, you know, like Charlie Chaplin's The Dictator, and yes, it's political and topical, and to do with what was going on at that period of time, or is it The Great Dictator, The Great Dictator? But it'll also, you know, like it'll stand the test of time, and that it'll 
you know, I mean, it's it's just good content in and of itself, and it's witty and clever, and I'm glad they're kind of back to that mo of just. Which kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about like, do you hyper fixate on your art or do you release for quantity? And I feel like they must have hyper fixated on that a little bit. Like they must have put that extra 5% of polish in to make it that good. Like they must have. They must have spent a little bit more time and money and effort just making sure that it was cohesive and well thought out and awesome. Because I, I feel like oh, it yeah. really stands up. Absolutely, and I'm sure at their level, um, they're, I, it's great, I mean, remembering that back in the day, at least, they used to uh, procrastinate, and they would, uh, I think, one day they would get the shows done, like, last minute. Six days to air. air. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, I mean, I I guess you can only really get away with that, with everything that they have go like everything they have going for them they have great teams obviously they probably know each other really well that they can get away with that but it's like um oh man it's like the i i guess when when you are also really honed in on that level you could surely um like getting in that five percent probably doesn't take as much time as you would think it's probably there they have a probably a, a lot of uh to some extent they're checking each other surely and many uh many chances to uh like kind of comment on like improving something and if you have the and if you have the right team of course you can always fix up something pretty quickly i'm uh, thinking of the 80 20 rule though where like you know the last 20 percent of the work takes 80 percent of the effort and i feel like that must be true in this instance as well where like they must have put in just an order of magnitude more effort to get that caliber of, of release. But I might be wrong also. <laughs> I'm just speculating as a, as a fan. Like there was something special. I was thinking of like, again, uh, we talked about Dave Chappelle last time. I, I, I love Dave Chappelle. I'm seeing him on New Year's. I've, I've got You're my tickets. Him on New Year's? Yeah. Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> we might have an extra oh, seat man. if you want to go. Like, I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to come if I could. Yeah, yeah. message me. I, it might be some money because I think my one friend bought like ten tickets and he's trying to sell them off to like you know serious fans. But like, if you want to come, we we've got like a suite uh, at a hotel there. I don't know which one, and then a bunch of us are just gonna go and like see Dave Chappelle and like you're 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 invited. So like like text me and remind me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I would love to go if uh, uh, the. I actually, uh, one of the things I wanted to tell you about was that um, I am working, I'm working on a bunch of different uh, musical brands um, at the same time, basically. Um, there is um, segueing into why I need to be in New York on New Year's Eve, unfortunately. Ah, is, uh, you is, uh, <laughs> I would I'd absolutely love to see Dave Chappelle. But yeah. there's, uh, we are... Um, I think I told you last time I'm involved in doing these uh, live streams for dance music. Um, and we used to do this on a weekly basis when we were testing it out. Again, kind of ex- a little bit going back to what we were talking about, how fast you can pull things together once yeah. you're experienced. But the uh, like for the first two years that we worked on this, we streamed every week. We tried to figure out like what 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 do people like and who are they, where are they, and like what are they doing while we stream and like everything ridiculous like that. And like. Now we do it once a month because we know that these people love the love when we pack all the best stuff into one one thing once a month. Um, but we we do every New Year's Eve a live stream marathon where it's a minimum of twelve hours. It used to actually be like a fifteen hour thing where we would hit all the the, the main kind of a new uh, New Year's events ranging from like the Middle East to like California. Cool. Um, and <laughs> and we. Uh, it's it's one of our biggest nights uh, where we also try to bring as many guests as we can. We usually try to get like a minimum of a couple artists that we're working with to do like an hour set each, even if it's remotely. Like they're able to, you know, we're, we're they're, I mean, they're sending us a, it's like a radio show. They're sending us a, a set that they made that was live, but we're, you know, we'll be performing it for the first time that live set on that radio show. If that makes sense. That's awesome. Um. So like, uh, and we want to do more and more of that. But New Year's Eve is going to be a a, a live streaming marathon. <laughs> it used to be my friend and I, DJ Braj, 
he's my DJing partner. Well, we used to just go back, back to back for 15 hours straight, and we'd be, we would just pass out afterward. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> we do every, we did everything from, uh, uh, you know, a segment of, uh, you know, um, all the biggest hits from the last 10 years to like the the most uh, requested tracks from. Uh, from this year to here's like the deep cuts from this type of music or the deep cuts of this and then uh the end we just go absolutely bonkers with the energy that's like cool. you know go like pretty much hard style or dubstep or i'm kind of like now i'm like why do i have to see dave Chappelle? i want to be in new york <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i think i told you my parents live in manhattan and my sister lives in lower manhattan and my brother lives in brooklyn so we got to find a way to connect. Like, I'm sure I'll be in the city at some point, and I should probably hit you up when I am. Absolutely. Just let me know when you're in the city. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm always outside the city, but I'm always kind of coming in every now and then. Yeah. Well, and I, um, for Thanksgiving this year, I didn't even go. I, I went to a coworker's house and hung out with him and his wife and kid. But, like, at some point, like, I mean, you know, I'll find a way. <laughs> like, I've got plenty of reasons to go, and so I just need to let that activation energy build up and either fly out or do the six hour drive from Pittsburgh. So, yeah. Is it six hours? Like I, I it's approximately six hours. Yeah. I, I feel like on, on a really good day, I drove out to a, a closer to Philly, but, but Philly's Pittsburgh a lot closer than away. Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah. You can get to Philly in like two and a half hours from Manhattan. I would say. Cause Pennsylvania is massive. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a big <laughs> wide rectangle <laughs> it's, it's, and, and we're in western pennsylvania and so we're on the other side of the state from philly absolutely no i mean i, I love to, i've never been to pittsburgh still i'd love to go sometime so obviously uh i mean if you're interested in robotics we've got a lot of robotics going on <laughs> that's that's like our thing now is is we're just a huge robotics town and so i mean that's i don't know we got a good food scene uh, we've got a decent bar scene. Um, we've got a great robotics scene, and it's it's a good place to be. Um, you get a lot for your money here, which I really really like. Mm. So, unlike New York. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Well, and like my brother probably pays like seven times as much as I do in rent for his Brooklyn place. Uh, and then he's got an Austin, Texas place that I'm sure he pays way more than I do in rent as well for. <laughs> so, Austin, yeah. Texas seems to have. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that's like blown up to like astronomical, like values at this point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my brother and his wife were trying to buy a house a while ago, and there's no fucking way. Like they they told their landlord they wanted to buy the place, and he just laughed at them. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, they were like, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna keep yeah. milking this asset as long as I can. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious. Uh, like, have have there been any projects like kind of in your uh, like periphery going on related to, uh, let's say, I don't know, machine learning and uh, like content creation? Like, we we're talking about the AI art. Oh, interesting. And, uh, we were talking about websites. that. So honestly, that stuff doesn't come across my bench as much. Um, the closest I got was somebody came by that was trying to do. Um, mixed reality so they wanted to do a art project where you put on like a hollow lens and you could see a pianist playing a piece and it would you would get the perfect view no matter where you were sitting in the in the um i think it was in the round so there was like a 360 degree view but everybody got the same view and so that was kind of interesting um you can do that with mixed reality Given what we do, um, I mean, that's the closest I've gotten. But, I mean, I really enjoy, I've got a buddy who's a data, data scientist, and I've got a few, but I've got one buddy in particular who's, like, really got me into as a drinking game, opening uh, OpenAI, Dolly, and just try to put in ridiculous shit. So, like, my Microsoft uh, profile picture right now for, like, the office suite is a lobster smoking a cigarette. From OpenAI. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, I probably should change it for work, but I, I think people think it's funny. And so it's just a lobster smoking a cigarette. It's exactly like, but it's amazing that they can do that, that you can just give it that text prompt and it figures it out. And it's like, 
this is what that looks like. Here you go. You know, I mean, it's just incredible that the, the technology's come that far recently. And so what are your thoughts? Like, what have you been looking into in that area? I've been very fascinated by um, the idea of this being possible also on the music front or audio front, whatever that might be. That's wild. And I, I'm i not, you know, I confess that I'm not, like, close to any project that's happening in that area currently, but I would be very interested to, like, if, I don't know, if somebody wanted to start a project like that, I would absolutely love to get involved. Um, the, um, I can see how it's uh, probably easier to create like a platform for visual arts where people are able to share it much more le easily on social media. Um, but I can totally imagine like film studios or um, marketing agencies or whatever, being able to benefit from having that uh, like multimedia AI creation tool. I mean, I can, um, you know, I don't know the way that my, you know, uneducated, uh, guess and how that would work is probably like we were talking about all the permutations of yeah um creating something i mean if you're able to create a template for an ai to create something i'm sure that it can with enough uh, data and inputs and um you know it's a uh, i can imagine that in the future a creative's position will be to create more of these templates rather than creating that quantity which is again going to be a massive like quantum leap if that was possible um, yeah that makes a lot of sense and, and i kind of agree with you i mean i haven't really thought about this with respect to music but it makes sense that if you can feed certain parameters into an ai it should be able to just create permutations on a song and then the artist in this case will be able to select what they want and improve the prompt i i was hanging out with a friend maybe two nights ago and they showed me a bunch of um, AI generated art that they'd purchased at an art fair. And I thought, I'm like, why'd you buy that? You can just, and they're like, well, it took a lot of effort to get the prompt right and, and zero in and like get it really, really awesome. And I'm like, good point. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, um, what, what did I see recently? It must have taken ages for this to be created, but like the new Indiana Jones movie that's supposedly coming out There's next another year. One? After the Crystal gonna Skull, they're gonna they're gonna revamp that dumpster fire. Okay, great. I'll watch yeah, it. To be honest, I, I do like the originals. I'm not a fan of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> they, they they announced it was gonna be Harrison Ford's last one on that as well. Okay, that's so, pretty cool. I mean, he's. He's old as hell, so I can yeah, imagine he wants yeah. to move on and retire. <laughs> I'm surprised if he doesn't have but, a cane in the movie. He's like, I'm an old man now. <laughs> you know? But what they what they did was they used the anti age like sort of like de aging. Oh technology Jesus! To, he's gonna apparently look young in That's at least stupid. some parts of the movie. I shouldn't say that. Like <laughs> I I just saw some some. It news actually on does. I'll I'll that. still watch it. I mean if. I just feel like it'll be difficult to hit that bullseye. Like, it'll be really difficult to get that right. And I suspect they're going to try to do it by committee and they're going to ruin it in doing so. But I really hope it's not like the South Park, you know, they're raping that stormtrooper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really hope that's not what they do and it's something good. And I'll still watch it in, in hopes that it's something good. Once it comes out on the internet, probably. <laughs> right. And, and I, I guess that, I mean, we, we can go on and on about, you know, how we feel about Disney and like how they treat Star Wars and all these other franchises and whatever, but they, I mean, I guess that is a, oh man, it's a, it's a testament to uh, how uh, um, you can also get things wrong. You can have all the money in the world, you can have all the resources and you can still get things wrong. Yeah. And it's, uh, it is a. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, at the same time, though, Disney is one of the few companies that can get away with these, like, um, massive investments for five, ten years developing a movie and then creating an event out of it. There aren't many companies that can get away with that. Um, but it, that's obviously like a budget issue. It's like only it's Disney has. 
Yeah, Disney has billions of dollars to develop whatever they want. And I can imagine that this AI technology potentially comes from somewhere like Disney or, um, you know, they would have the resources to do it. Um, it is a matter of, I mean, I, 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 going just going back to being just a matter of time, I do think it's a matter of time that, like, um, we will have more and more AI collaborations between content creators and, I don't know, whoever the owner of these companies are. Straight up math, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, and to be honest, like, I, I can see it now that you bring it up. I mean, I think that's a probable future probable i mean i say like 90 percent. that's where we're going you know so yeah I, I mean i haven't thought about that from a music perspective but you're right and uh, yeah i mean it's people were concerned again when like pirate bay came out talking about the copyright and all that yeah like, this is something i've wanted to talk about with you and that's <laughs> yeah that's uh uh, the copyright issue, like, it became obvious back then that, like, if people can get something for free yeah. once it's been digitized. I mean, who knows? Like, it's a... Uh, I mean, people will do whatever they can to try to get it for free. So it's like the... It could be music. It could be really any other information out there. If uh, or Maybe one day we have... Uh, we all have uh, 3D printers and we can create our own stuff and, you know, <laughs> we might not even need manufacturing anymore. Who care? Who knows? But... I'm just throwing out ideas like once yeah we could get there but it's far out in terms of the 3d printing technology we currently have i i heard a speech eight years ago by somebody that claimed that by now we would have the ability to print entire robots i'm like i don't think so what would it take to print uh, an entire robot i'm sure like you need a massive machine and a lot of yeah, yeah. well uh like I think the ability to print circuits in a reliable way is is currently very very challenging, and there are companies that are doing it. So like Nano Dimension, I think is one of them, and I don't know how good their tech is because I haven't really looked at it under the microscope. So I, I just don't know where the current state of the art is. But given my understanding of where we're at, I mean to get good electrical properties out of something that you've printed, and to get, I mean, it costs you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to stand up a semiconductor fab. And there's a reason why. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to get that level of accuracy on that small of a, a thing. Um, and even to do that on, on a bigger thing is challenging. Like, to be able to get, like, if you wanted to create, like, you know, Charles Babbage's different, I mean, I think you can print that now. But, like, I mean, that's 1800s technology. <laughs> I think maybe 1700s. Don't quote me on this, but it's hundreds of years old, and and you can you can barely print that in a reliable way now. And so, I don't know. I, I think the technology is lagging, and and it's difficult. I mean, it's it's really challenging to be able to print, you know, a semiconductor. I mean, I don't think you can do that. Like maybe you may be able to at some point in history. You probably will be able to at some point in history, but. I don't think we're that close and I, I think it's going to take a lot of time and knowledge of a lot of people and failure and failure and more failure and, and it's a lot of people don't appreciate or realize that and I think I've come up with a way to frame it where I don't sound like a pessimist it's just I mean that's what it takes like Thomas Edison failed 300 times before coming up with a light bulb and it wasn't him it was him and a t massive team of folks working you know day and night and and I mean, that's just what it is. That's what it takes to do a thing that's never been done before is a fuckload of people trying to do it and, and smashing their heads on rocks, getting it wrong. And eventually you might get it like half the time and then you can refine that into like 80% of the time. And you can refine that into like 90%. And it's just like, it's just a lot of work. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's how human society progresses, but... That's how human society progresses. So if you think we're just going to instantaneously be in this world of flying cars and, you know, 3D printed, you know, whatevers, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work and, and, you know, just give it some time is all I'm saying. Sure. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, sorry, I'm asking you questions now. but no, it's, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> Do you think that? Do you think that um, 
it's inevitable that um, at least if you're able to make something cool enough that people, if there's a market for people to buy these kinds of new, uh, you, you have these new incremental um, advances in technology. I mean, I don't know, just the, the closest thing I saw recently to a flying car was like, it was basically like drone technology, but turned into like a bigger thing that people could sit in. And like, it's not like people would be able to practically use that now, but you're able to, let's say, go to Dubai and be able to fly around in that in the desert. Is this Joby or, or something different? I don't, I'm not familiar with the name, but I saw some advertisement for that, which was insane. And I could imagine that like, you know, it's, it's probably, it's a novelty right now, I'm sure. But like, who knows? I mean, do you, do you think that, you know, if, uh, hmm. I, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that like me, like me, you get to a point where something is cheap enough and you can kind of mass produce it if you have enough interest could that potentially like take over i mean could it like make it you you can't violate the laws of physics or but I, then again i mean we were able to put a person on the moon from like what is it the kennedy announced that intent in like 62 or like you know, by the end of this decade, we will put a man on the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard, you know, and it's like we were able to actually do that. And it, it took a shitload of work and money, a shitload of money. But like, I mean, you have to unify a lot of people behind a thing and it just takes time. And, and, and there's failure. We blew up a lot of rockets trying to do that. I mean, and, and people died, you know, and. I mean, that's, that's how it goes. But, I mean, we got there in the end. So, like, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's achievable to do that sort of thing. But, like, you have to consider that when you're pushing the limits of technology, there's always going to be failure. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm sorry if that's, like, a little bit of a diversion from the question. No, no, absolutely. That's, that's great. I, I think, um, I guess where I'm going... I guess where I was originally trying to go was, uh, I guess, talking about the, the whole copyright issue. <laughs> we went Sorry, all the way over totally here from different. that. But I, I guess uh, just kind of going back to that, like something I've been really pondering, again, in the face of this quantity of content and all being more important than creating one commission to work in most cases, like, the le I mean, I can imagine that this could music might be the first casualty of this and I can imagine this could in other ways affect other industries as well but once you have so much access to a certain product I mean like the you know the the battle for a quantity and presence becomes more so the importance there and the uh, big you know but the what it's created an environment where you know the the major players major investors they invest we've gone back to investing in people people who have a track record of being able to replicate certain uh, results that they're looking for and never comes down to one piece of work it's always a series of um, projects or, or work that just kind of proves that this person is capable like you I wonder if um, I, I, I don't know I, I I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is I'm seeing that, uh, you know, copyright, at least in the music sense, is not necessarily in, in, as important anymore. You're not, uh, um, it's nice to know that you're being credited, obviously, for the work that you've done. But like, by the time someone has shared your work a million times on TikTok, people are not necessarily looking at it for you. They don't give a They're fuck about your them. copyright. <laughs> yeah, they they don't care about the um yeah, they might they used your sound bite surely to enhance whatever it is that they did. But um I mean rarely does that really result in any kind of real Direct income for you. Yeah. And it's uh um we have these new inventions like NFTs that attempt to make ownership important again. I, I just really, I wonder from your point of view, do you see that as the ownership after all this free access being important anymore? I, I kind of, I wonder that myself. We don't have an environment where it's 
It depends on really the thing. It. However, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. What I'm trying to say is, like, I, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out ways to patent technology that myself and several colleagues were working on. And at the end, the deduction that my one business partner came up with, and uh, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, is that patents are for boomers. You know, and that's not really something that we should be pursuing. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like there's definitely, like I used to work for a company called SpaceX. Um, I was only an intern, but I mean, I, I worked for them and my boss, Elon Musk's perspective on patents were like, that's like a blueprint, you know, for someone else to be able to build your rocket. And so, you know, just defend your trade secrets. And, and there's a lot to be said for that, I think. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I'm of the opinion that innovation costs innovation and making things that are difficult to rip off is a better IP defense than a patent or a copyright or you can't take this because it's mine, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I, I think I, I probably agree with you in this way. I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to defend something just by virtue of like, I'll sue you if you try to take this. But if you have a ton of money, you could probably tie someone up with harassing lawsuits if they try to take, like, I don't know. But at the same time, I mean, look at like, like Disney versus like South Park making fun of Disney. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, you know, they still make fun, like tons of people make fun of Disney. I mean, and I mean, they've got the Millennium Copyright Extension Act, or maybe it's not the Millennium. I, you know what I mean? Like the copyright term, the Mickey Mouse laws, the idea that like copyrights now last forever in a day because of fucking Mickey Mouse. <laughs> like the fact that Disney didn't want to relinquish that. So they've lobbied at, at the extreme scale to be able to extend copyright terms so that they can hold on to this ridiculous over 100-year-old IP of Mickey Mouse. And so, I don't know. I feel like that's that's a real thing. Right, absolutely. And so, um, would you say that you'd be, um, I guess from an outsider's point of view, would you feel optimistic that um we could find some sort of solution again and um uh you know music industry relating that uh you know we could mm, i suppose the monetization model is really the is part of the issue obviously but it's you know there it's really hard to um Outside of Spotify, you don't really have much control in how people use your stuff. People can still rip your stuff off the internet and throw it into a DJ set somewhere, and they take credit for the great vibes. Let's say the great vibes that they created at their show, and they get hired, uh, you know, to do more DJ gigs and keep ripping, potentially ripping, uh, you know, other people's music off. Uh, and you know, it, it's uh, there's nothing stopping from this happening in the, in the broader music industry. I, I just gave one example of like, I'm sure every, like, um, you know, everyone is guilty of at some point, like needing something for a school project, they rip something off the internet. Like, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like, sure. it, it. so it's not really a, do you think that we can get people to care about that again? It, it, probably is not. That, it's a really difficult question. Yeah, I mean, Probably not. Like some companies for sure. I mean, like every time I hear a Black Keys song on a commercial, I'm like, how much money have these guys made on royalties, which is ownership, which is IP, which goes contrary to the point we're making right now. But like, think about it. All the times you've heard a Black Keys song on something and you're just like, these motherfuckers are loaded on royalty money. You know, I mean, that, that happens. On the other hand, um, I mean, I, I feel like There's other ways, right? I mean, we've seen this for like maybe 15 years now, like concerts versus album sales being the way that bands make money. I mean, I think that's big. Like the fact that I'm excited to see Dave Chappelle live in New Year's Eve this year, you know, versus, I mean, I could listen to all the Netflix specials and, you know, YouTube the fuck out of Dave Chappelle and... I still wouldn't get to see him live. So I think there's something to be said for that too. 
absolutely. That's a uh, that's very exciting to think about too, in the sense that um, for uh, maybe that's the um, I don't know maybe maybe we get to a point where people get so tired of being bombarded by similar stuff that we start to appreciate those moments together again and that's like i I hope that that's a hope that that's the thing for the future i mean i guess everything i'm talking about right now is kind of like the state of like what was the state of the union right now but i hope that this is a i hope that that's obviously a alternative for the future um I, I I wonder just because of human nature, again, it's like a it could go either way. I mean, I, I'm optimistic in the sense that like, I mean, I, I know that people will always make like bad choices, but there's always a group of people that appreciate, and um, you know, all you need is a good a good group of people to kind of get by. Well, also, I I like anytime someone goes on tour that I really love, I always try to go see them live, and that's like the I think that's, yeah, that has sort of become the goal. It's like, I mean, yeah, it's a um, kind of going back to what we talked about probably even half a year ago. We were talking about how like uh, all the all all the stuff that you put out there online has become advertising content for you to be able to go to that um, that that true experience, whether that's uh, the concert or being able to um, buy like one off like like cool merchandise or whatever that is that really like enhances your life in a, in a real physical way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, that, that is definitely how, how things are and how things have become the, um, it, yeah. And back in the day, obviously used to be the opposite. People used to just rake in the millions by just selling records, but that's like, not, you know, that's the, the old world. Yeah, we're not there um, anymore. I mean, the way the technology yeah. currently is, like, I think we're just past that. Because it used to be you had to wait for your song to come on the radio, and then if you wanted to hear it more than that, you had to buy a record. There was no other way with the tech at that point in time. We're not there anymore. We're just, that's not where the current technology is, and maybe that's okay. So perhaps just building better interfaces for everything is just the key. Uh, that's uh, a huge key. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, what, what do you think of like platforms like the the whole virtual reality thing? Let's say that Met, that Meta has been creating. Like how how do you feel about all that? I'm nervous to comment because Meta is so litigious, but I feel like it's it's been an interesting thing to watch because on the one hand, um, what they're doing is truly groundbreaking. I mean, and the fact that you know you can be somewhere that you're not and and engage in this different world and and all that but on the other hand i mean they just announced that they'd created legs for their characters and nobody gave a fuck you know and so i i feel like it's it's an interesting thing because i guess i, I maybe if i'm being optimistic nobody gives a fuck because they haven't seen it all come to fruition yet so it might be that they're leading into something amazing and we just haven't seen the light at the end of the tunnel yet and that's why we haven't clenched on and and become invested on the other hand i i mean i stopped using facebook like four or five years ago because i found it was a little too addictive and not a good use of my time i am not in a hurry to buy an oculus and throw myself full bore into that you know and, and forget about you know my real life relationships with people to pursue online like i don't know I'm not in a hurry to do that. Um, I don't necessarily know that it's not all right. I mean, I had several meetings on, you know, Google Meets and Zoom and Microsoft Teams today where, you know, we accomplished a lot of work and there's something to be said for that virtual environment. But I don't know that I want to go all in on it either. I feel like it's it's maybe my approach is or my position is somewhere in the middle, if that makes sense. I, I agree. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sort of with you there in terms of like, it's definitely not a place that I'm able to even really actively contribute to yet, I feel. But I, what I what I see uh, where I was segueing with that was sort of the trends of like what um, younger people are doing and also talking about the, you know, concerts and stuff and how like people are have concerts over Fortnite and, you know, the way that they will um, 
their their new way of chatting is almost like being able to jump into a converse a constantly ongoing conversation because the interface in itself i mean i think part of why it's that way is everyone might be on their game <laughs> they might be playing their video game or whatever and they don't want to have to like um you know, constantly pick up or you know drop conversations. So they they create we create chats. Let's say on Discord or some uh, platform like that. People are able to just jump in to talk whenever they're ready, and or they're able, there's no back and forth like, hey, you want to hop on? It's just kind of like I'm here now, and <laughs> it makes it makes it feel less like you're away from your friends. You're just always at you know you just you want to talk to this group of people. Just they're right at your fingertips now in a different way than let's say another messenger app was and imagine the withdrawal when that goes away (laughs) (laughs) i i don't engage in that way personally i still love the idea of being able to hone in on like being able to talk to individuals instead of just like jumping from one group to another but like the um i i can totally see how that has like formed i think a lot of like younger kids like basically instead of going to like hang out in a mall when they're in middle school would go to create these groups online over video games where it's a lot cheaper and easier to do more things your parents aren't worried Um, about you getting abducted or whatever (laughs) exactly and like so so that's i mean that's just like my like quick theory on like why why this is happening but it's like it's made either way these younger kids are now involved in this um this virtual reality and even though these other platforms that are like on a higher level aren't ready yet i can see that potentially um not not fully replacing in-person concert experience i think that will always still be a vip experience but it's going to create another layer to the funnel in the oh, way interesting. that you know, so you can be there virtually, you can listen to it before that, and then you can be there in person after that. And so, yeah, that's that makes sense. It, and how I can relate to this already is that um, I'll always tune into like replays of, uh, of let's say, a, a full Tomorrowland live stream set. Yeah. Or, or just yeah. tune into the live thing, but like, it's a, uh, we have live streaming, we have uh, replays on YouTube of full, you know, published sets. I mean, if you're on the fence, if you want to see someone live, you can just check them out right there. And that is a fantastic way to kind of get people over the edge to investing in the full experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can only imagine that becoming more expansive. I can only think that would make you, like you said, want to go more though. Like if you, like, I don't know when I was, in EDM in like the early 2000s as a teenager and I would listen to digitally imported and I would hear like the roaming raver you know on like Sirius or whatever and like be like oh shit I want to go to a rave like I gotta experience this because it sounds like so much fun you know and like fuck this is awesome and like if I hadn't heard that I don't think I would have ever wanted to do that in the way that I did and, and then gone to like dozens of raves and, and and checked it out firsthand. I think it was having that digital introduction and feeling, you know, that euphoria, you know, remotely that made me want to feel it stronger in person. And so I don't know. I mean, I, I I think just you know, yeah, my own personal experience is that you know it's it's just a hook. I mean, or you know, another experience that hooks you into wanting like a deeper level of experience, you know. And and so I don't know that that's necessarily harmful to the industry or the art absolutely uh, yeah I, I agree with that and uh I, I guess what i was you know all the questions i was asking before is kind of see like how far you know what is the risk what is the risk that these technologies can take over that experience at what point does this become better than the live experience i mean um i i mean this is one where I personally believe they won't just because people crave human connection. Yeah. And we see what happens when people aren't connected and we've seen this, like, you know, we don't have to, (laughs) in the more recent events, like what happens when people are stuck at home for too long. You can't hug someone over the internet yet. (laughs) You know, and even if you could, like, I don't know, it's going to be the same. Um, I mean, yeah, the tech's getting better and better and better, but it's not a substitute for real human experience. 
and and you know just yeah i mean the stories you generate when you go out into the world and interact with people one-on-one -on -one, i mean like it's i don't know maybe not maybe i'm an old man but like i i feel like that's always going to be better and more interesting and and you know more interactive i mean like you said the fact that during the pandemic we had the height you know at, at 2020 like which is i mean it's pretty recently of of telepresence technology and we still couldn't really emulate the feeling of like people were getting depressed and you know i mean i don't know i i, I don't think there's a substitute yet and and maybe there never will be maybe there will be i don't know where the tech is going in the future or how we're going to figure out how to supplement those endorphins or like what zuck is working on to try to do that you know but i, I feel like i don't know i mean it, it hasn't it's not been a replacement yet put it that way right yeah i mean i, I guess uh, when it comes to all these different areas that these are these are all kind of questions that I had on my mind, and always curious to ask different people what they think. Um, I'm 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 like so fascinated where these things could go, and in my mind, uh, as like someone who sees like what like firsthand what people are like really uh, investing their focus into. Like young kids are like like they love this technology. Obviously, it's, it's novel it's novel now. And who knows how people, how much people care about it in the, in the in the future once it's not novel anymore. But like, I'm always just curious to see like, what's that next technology that tips the scale towards um, a whole different way of working. Yeah. And um, and I mean, all these things already have tipped the scale towards needing to be a, you know, you're not just a musician. You're now also a, you've got to learn how to use Photoshop. You got to learn how to create some like cool videos like it's it's not being an artist is all these things now it's not um i have to do that as a roboticist <laughs> yeah you know I, I was the other day going through some video shoots i'm like i have to do video shoots that's a real part of my life you know photo shoots and video shoots of, of robots i work on or nobody's ever going to know it existed you know and that's i don't know it's just part of the world we live in now <laughs> it's, it's where we're yeah. at <laughs> yeah and um but i mean uh i don't know where you want to segue to from uh, from here but um the um i guess uh just i don't know, just touching right back to like where we started that like my goal is to try to help um creators like navigate these areas like and i love to be as future focused as possible try to help figure out you know and again, that is really the only way to stay on top of these things. It's like, just figure out every avenue to help creatives or a group of creatives accomplish some sort of goal, but also like provide goals that like are, can, that you can actually monetize from. Yeah. Not just, uh, um, we're, we're living in a, again, that, 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 you know, heavy quantity kind of, kind of world. How do we accomplish that? um that in itself helps people monetize but how do we also build that in a meaningful way across multiple platforms um you know how can if we're missing someone from the team how can we well what are we missing how can we enhance this further i try to figure that kind of stuff out um there's a um you know it's a i you know i I don't know where I could go from there. That's kind of a summary of, I don't know. I feel like I just summarized so much right there. Yeah. I mean, we could, um, we could always like call it and try to, you know, wrap up for the day. I mean, we've been recording for two hours, yeah. but I could also just keep talking I mean, for hours. This is all fascinating. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, we can always do another. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we call it? Anytime. So, okay, so Absolutely. the summary is that you're trying to help creatives see what's coming next and maximize their potential is what I'm getting. And that's with Polar Bull Productions. And that's, that's a way to basically deliver the insights of having been there to people that haven't done it yet but are looking to get there, which is pretty Absolutely. goddamn cool in my opinion. I mean, that's, you know. Thank that's, you. It, it, yeah, that's good for everybody. Not, not... And on the most basic level too, we have uh, what this what I hope this results in 
is uh, we've started off by offering DJ services for all kinds of events. We try to create as uh, cool, customized events as possible. We've, again, just as an example, we DJ um, uh, yoga yoga classes here locally. We do everything from that to club DJing to, nice. um, you know, private parties, whatever you want to do. Um, it's, uh, you know, this collective is just mainly helping build more talent to make these things cooler. If you want, whether it's events or, um, or you're looking for uh, uh, any kind of music services to produce, a, I don't know, let's say, trailer for your next uh, um, product release or something like that. We can create stuff like that as well. Um, that's uh, right now, musically speaking, we have a team for that. The next level is we can create the visuals for it too. You can see nice. on our website that we have a, a, a demo reel of what it looks like when we capture events. We want to be able to expand that to another level as well. So it's not just music we're talking about. Um, visual you know video production and going on from there you know badass and way easier said than done by the way that takes so much work and yeah. skill to get right uh i'll it do my time. own absolutely i'll do my own plug too which is uh that collaborative with spencer kraus is sponsored by ska ska custom robots and machines <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, Very cool. Thanks for coming on, Corel. I appreciate it. If you like stuff like this, subscribe, check out Polar Bowl Productions, and uh, come back again because we love having you here. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll do it again soon.